Welcome all to our fourth session uh, on uh, ethics technology and ethics of technologies. In this session, we will talk. And we have a very uh, distinguished guests from uh, different countries. So it is this is the first international uh, session uh, uh, which uh, was held uh, from the beginning. I mean, from the beginning of this day. So we have uh, different experiences uh, here in this session, and we will make it benefit uh, beneficial for all. I hope uh, so. Uh, it is uh, it will be useful for uh, our speakers to remind that we have uh, twenty minutes allotted for every single person, every single uh, speakers, and uh, I, we have uh, Carol uh, Bynum. Uh, Professor uh, Carol uh, from the United States, and uh, I, I have I will give very little information about the uh, works of uh, Carol Ward Bynum, uh, which is very related to the topics we are discussing uh, through the day, throughout the day. Uh, cyber philosophy, for example, philosophy in the information age, uh, and you look at the Aristotle's theory of per uh, perfection, artificial intelligence, biology, and intentional states, computer ethics, and many others. So all these articles and uh, other books, other works show that he is very much interested in the ethics and the related issues we are discussing now. So uh, it, it is my pleasure to host this session and uh, it is uh, considered by all members, all the participants, a chance and honor to have all these uh, speakers now. And it is a chance for me also, Professor Carol, to listen to you. And you have the microphone, please, here you are. We are ready to listen and uh, take our notes. Okay, uh, are we set then? Yeah, please go on. Okay, all right. Uh, I'll get started here. Okay, and uh, I'll quickly go through the ones that I was already showing so I can get to the new ones. Um, so there's my title. And thank you so much for having me. I feel honored. And my presentation will have three parts. First, I'll talk about Norbert Wiener. Uh, then I'll talk about flourishing ethics in general. And then I'll say some things about my own flourishing ethics theory. The information revolution is often described uh, as um, the fact that it, information technology is uh, accelerating remarkable changes in the world in nearly every culture and society. And so as a result, um, new digital devices, as well as impressive broad communication networks are generating serious ethical questions. How can this challenge be met? We need an ethics theory for the information age. Fortunately, a number of thinkers have taken on this challenge um, beginning as early as the uh, 1940s. My own efforts began only in 1978. The founding father of this important effort was Norbert Wiener at MIT. That's what he looked like back then. Who was Norbert Wiener? Well, the information revolution, which is profoundly changing our world, depends to a very large extent upon the remarkable number of Wiener's many different achievements. For example, he helped Claude Shannon develop information theory. Uh, Shannon came to his house regularly on Sundays uh, for several months, uh, asking him, how do, I, 
how can I figure out how much information goes down a telephone wire? Uh, and Rainer worked with him and developed the math with him uh, and helped Claude Shannon develop information theory. He also was a key thinker in creating electronic computers. Um, he and John von Neumann and others uh, worked together and developed uh, the first computers. He also created and indeed masterfully applied cybernetic science. He had invented cybernetic science on a special project that I'm just about to tell you about. He also, and this is the amazing thing, he was a, he was a mathematician, he was a technician, um, and he also was a philosopher, actually got a PhD in philosophy from Harvard University. And he laid down a solid foundation for information ethics. As a result of all his work and many other things which I haven't been able to mention here, Wiener has become already one of the most influential thinkers in human history. Well, how did Wiener found information ethics? From the mid 1940s to early 1960s, he laid down a powerful foundation for today's information ethics. And if you consult three of his books, um, you'll discover that uh, much of what he did to lay the foundation for information ethics can be found in those three books. Um, it's a, really an interesting story, uh, what actually happened. Um, in World War II, uh, Wiener headed a team of people inventing a new anti-aircraft cannon. And that anti-aircraft cannon had to be able to perceive an airplane and then predict its path through the sky and then decide, the cannon had to decide where to aim. Then the cannon had to aim and fire the cannon. And this is the interesting part, all without human intervention all without human intervention. Well, Wiener realized as he was working on this project and he was developing the science of cybernetics, he realized something that he hadn't thought of before. I'm calling it Wiener's surprise realization. Future machines will be able to gather information from the world, store it, process it, even learn from their experiences. Then they will make decisions and carry them out without human intervention. Such machine decisions could be good ones, but they might instead be very harmful. So that led to a lot of worry for Wiener who was developing the science and the, the machines uh, that I've just described. And, and he became very worried. And in his books, he said things like this, we are here in the presence of a social potentiality of unheard of importance for good and for evil. The choice of good and evil knocks at our door. You can see that Wiener was very worried about what he was bringing into the world. So an amazing thing about Wiener's cybernetic analyses of the world is that he could cybernetically analyze practically anything. Uh, so he gave us a cybernetic analysis of human nature and all other living things, a cybernetic analysis of health, bodily functions and disease, a cybernetic analysis of thinking and reasoning and emotions and actions, a cybernetic analysis of interaction within groups and tribes and societies, and on and on and on his analyses of the world. Um, 
He even had a cybernetic analysis of the fundamental nature of existence. So uh, his philosophical training at Harvard <laughs> certainly served him well. He, he ended up with his cybernetic science to analyze all aspects of the world from the fundamental nature of existence to all these things and many other things that, that I, beyond what I mentioned. I, of course, was amazed that Wiener's ethical ideas could become so totally integrated with his new cybernetic worldview. And I thought of Aristotle and how his ethics theory was integrated with his whole worldview. Just to give, give you an analysis of that, the ethics theory that we want should be fully integrated with our understanding of the world. It should organize and make sense of our moral experience and ethical judgments. It should also integrate well with our best theories of reality, natural science, social science, society, politics. We want our ethics not to hang alone without any support or any relation to other things. We want to integrate it into our lives uh, and with the other things that we know about the world. That's like Aristotle's theory. Aristotle's theory is remarkably integrated with his metaphysics, his physics, biology, psychology, social and political, and political theory. So Aristotle's metaphysics, together with his physics and his biology, actually support his psychology, which in turn actually supports his ethics, which in turn actually supports his social and political theory. And so you can see that Aristotle's ethics is totally integrated with lots of other things about the world. Okay, so now I've, I've said some things about uh, Wiener and the wonderful things that he created, which helped to create the information revolution. I've said some things about how Wiener was able to integrate uh, his account of ethics and concern with the ethics of machines and so on in a way that relates to the whole world in all kinds of interesting ways. Now, um, I want to say a few things about uh, my own flourishing ethics project. Um, I got into computer ethics, information ethics in 1978. And so by 1999, I'd worked in the field of computer and information ethics for 21 years. Like most other researchers, I used traditional ethical theories, Kantianism, utilitarianism, to resolve new ethical issues arising from actions of humans who employed information technology. And like most other researchers, I often had success dealing with such cases. Notice it's the actions of humans using technology where those of us who were in information and computer ethics uh, were having some success. Challenging ethical problems arose, however, when benefits or harms were caused by actions or activities of the technology itself, by robots and softbots and other artificially intelligent entities. And right now, um, 70 years later, <laughs> after Wiener laid down the foundations for information ethics. Uh, the hot topic in the world is artificial intelligence and how that relates to ethics. And how can we get ethics instilled into the artificially intelligent entities that are all around the world? There are now millions of them. We, we have robots uh, doing surgery on humans. We have cars that slam on the brakes to keep you from getting into a crash. We have all kinds of medical devices which make medical judgments and carry out some medical procedures without the intervention of a doctor or a nurse and on and on it goes. Uh, and so right now the world 
uh, including governments and whole regions of the world, are, um, are very worried and are, are trying very hard to figure out how to integrate ethics into our artificially intelligent entities. Well, this problem uh, of not knowing how, how to deal with uh, actions of the technology itself. Um, Wayner warned us back in 1946 that this was going to happen. So I decided to launch a project to develop an ethical theory which could successfully meet Wayner's challenge ethics for artificially intelligent agents. But what makes an ethical theory excellent, I asked myself. The ethical theories that I most admired were those of Aristotle and Wiener, plus those of two very influential information ethics scholars, James Moore of Dartmouth College and Luciano Flority of Oxford University. Those four ethical theories uh, impressed me and so I wondered, what do those four ethical theories have in common? Why, why did, I, did I admire them so much? In considering all four theories, I discovered that each one, and this is very important, takes human flourishing as the highest value, or in the case of Florida, among the highest values. In addition, all four philosophers deeply integrate their ethical theories into the, into the whole world, um, just like Aristotle and Wiener, um, Moore and Flority also integrated their information ethics theory uh, into many different aspects of the world. Each of these features, I decided, should be necessary aspects of ethical theory for the information age, which I wanted to create. Were there other aspects that I should have included? I suddenly realized, um, Christina Goriak's hypothesis, known these days in the information ethics world as the Gorniak hypothesis. My colleague on the faculty at Southern Connecticut State, Christina Gorniak, in 1995, pointed this out. Quote, the very nature of the computer revolution indicates that the ethics of the future will have a global character. It will be global in a spatial sense, since it will encompass the entire globe. And it will also be global in the sense that it will address the totality of human actions and relations. And she also pointed out, the future global ethics will be a computer ethics. If this is the case, then computer ethics should be regarded as one of the most important fields of philosophical investigation. Well, how, how could I take account of the Gorniak hypothesis? I had to somehow take account of that, otherwise my goal would not be met. Uh, well, Professor Gorniak's hypothesis certainly is correct because of broad computer networks and ethical theory for the information age must apply to countries and cultures worldwide. But how is that possible? My answer is to assume that all human beings worldwide share a common human nature. And theories of human nature usually provide the grounds that are used to derive and support successful ethical theories. So the remarkable conclusion that one can draw from that is that flourishing ethics can establish a common ethical foundation for many cultures worldwide then each individual culture can add their own values and special traditions which help to make people's lives meaningful and fulfilling in that particular culture. So I see two parts. 
one part which is based on human nature, uh, which applies in cultures all around the world and the ethics that derives from that. And that's a foundation upon which all the different cultures and societies in the world can add their own values that make their lives meaningful, uh, that are traditional and, and important in their communities. Okay, some final comments about uh, flourishing ethics um, that are important. First, flourishing ethics is actually a family of ethical theories. It's not my theory or Aristotle's theory or Wiener's theory or Moore's theory. Uh, it's, it's a family of ethical theories that, have, that relate to each other uh, the, the way Wittgenstein would describe as having family resemblances. And flourishing ethics is an incomplete and ongoing project. Um, all around the world, we're trying to figure out how we can integrate artificially intelligent agents into our culture in such a way that is beneficial and not harmful. Uh, and in, in Europe, uh, there was a project um, three or four year project and 14 different scholars from 14 different countries tried to answer the question, how do we integrate ethics into artificially intelligent agents? Uh, similar projects are going on uh, in other countries and other places. Flourishing ethics can be conveniently divided into the two parts human-centered flourishing ethics and general flourishing ethics. The plan uh, that I've been following and uh, that I've been teaching to my students and so on is that we start with human-centered flourishing ethics uh, and get clear on that and develop that well, uh, and then try to expand that human-centered flourishing ethics to take in ethics involving non-humans uh, like uh, the animal liberation movement, uh, for example, and uh, ecology and saving saving the uh, the planet and so on. Um, so that's that's the strategy that we're following. So my main point here is that flourishing ethics is not one theory; it's a family. Uh, and beginning with Wiener, way back in nineteen forty four. Um, it, it's a project that's ongoing, and it will take, I believe, a decade or two uh, for the world to somehow find a way to integrate ethics with artificially intelligent agents. Uh, and I and others uh, are working on the effort to do exactly that. Okay, finally, I just want to close with a a story of special interest uh, for the particular audience of, of this workshop. Uh, as I mentioned, there are several thinkers that influenced my flourishing ethics theory uh, quite a lot. Uh, Aristotle, of course, and, and Wiener, of course. Uh, and I, I mentioned uh, James Moore, from Dartmouth and uh, his theories certainly have influenced me significantly. And Luciano Floridi at uh, Oxford, uh, his theories also have certainly influenced me. And of course, I uh, can't leave out Christina Gorniak, uh, her hypothesis was very important to me uh, in the beginning of my flourishing ethics project. Then there's a sixth person. And I was surprised. I didn't expect to be significantly influenced by that sixth person. Uh, and I, I think you may be surprised of who it was too. I certainly was. Nebisakantar from Turkey. Uh, and she has so much influenced my flourishing ethics theory uh, that she and I have published a couple of papers together uh, about flourishing ethics. Uh, and I expect we'll publish maybe five or six more papers together on it. And eventually I'll have to start calling it 
our theory of flourishing ethics rather than my theory of flourishing ethics. Uh, and uh, what happened was, which was very interesting to me, um, and, and that is that in, 19, in 2018, I got an email from Nesiva, uh, uh, and she said, can I come and study with you because I want to write my doctoral dissertation on your flourishing ethics theory. I was, wow, surprised. And, and I wrote back and said, sure, you can come and visit here if you wish. And it was arranged for her to come and, and visit with me. And I would teach her my flourishing ethics theory. And then she would go back to Turkey and uh, work with her dissertation committee and, and do her dissertation. Um, what yeah. I discovered, however, is when I started teaching her about my flourishing ethics theory, suddenly, she was teaching me. I learned new things about my own theory from Nessel. Uh, and so instead of being the teacher, I became the student as she taught me some interesting new things about my own theory. Anyway, <laughs> that yeah. is a, a fascinating uh, story to tell, uh, especially to the audience of this workshop. Thank you very much for the opportunity and I, I yield the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. Thank you very much. Although we exceeded our deadline, I consider it unfair to warn you because of the comprehensive uh, presentation. So we benefited much uh, from the presentation. And it is very exhilarating and exciting to listen to the story you were part of. So, uh, and it, we have uh, indeed, we, today we have listened to Nesiba uh, about the theory that she worked on and she is still working on. So we know uh, she's working on you and your theories. This flourishing ethics, it is good. And thank you for the contribution you made to this uh, process. And now uh, it's time to move uh, on to our next uh, speaker. Um, uh, really, uh, it, uh, I don't need to refer to you because Carol uh, referred to you, uh, Christina. So you have the microphone, please. Uh, we are ready to listen and to benefit from your uh, presentation. Please, here you are. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me here. And please let me know when my time will be coming to the end. Of this so okay. I okay, I will warn you. <laughs> okay. And um, wow, how can I ever say thank you to Terry? I mean, that doesn't happen that the teacher would praise a student to such a degree. I mean, it is, it is the other way. And it should be the other way. Now, my other teacher, Merva, I'm trying to do the screen. Um, oh, OK. So the first step has been done. I kind of, but now, you know, my, <laughs> my topic is somewhat going against what Terry was saying, because he was talking about flourishing ethics. And I will be talking about competing moral values. So that there will be a little bit more of a, of a disagreement there than it was in, in Terry's presentation. Sorry, Terry. But it's not the disagreement with you. Um, I just said that I also teach the religious studies program. So when I was thinking about this conference, my issue was that uh, the computer ethics, thanks to the technology, actually, to a large degree, replaced the old ethical systems and put itself in a sort of collision course with the well-established systems that for centuries were uh, basically hosted by religions, pretty much every big world religion and a small one too, has 
created its own ethical system. The way I see it, since these religions grew out of smaller units, tribal societies and so on, the ethical systems of most religions were rooted in the needs of a particular society. And they were responding to the problems of the society and they were trying to, to shape the society in the best way. So in other words, it was in a sense, sort of from the bottom up movement. And of course, since we are talking about religions, there is always this uh, belief in the existence of a higher than humans power, which we usually call God, at least in, in, in the Western um, societies. So from my point of view, what happened was that the emergence of new way of looking at the, at the world created a conflict between how ethics was understood and created uh, in the religions and how it started to be created and thought of in, uh, in, in the new type of societies, which from my point of view, this new paradigm, so to say, was born around the time of Reformation, religious wars, and then scientific revolution, and all that was happening in Europe at the time you all know, 16th, 17th century, and so on, of this new um, approach to the reality that it was Europe, because when we talk later on about glo globalization, we basically talk about the spread of the European approach to the reality all over the world, and not, al not always a very friendly spread. So to me, the scientific revolution is the, the really, really important moment that changed, so to say, the trajectory of, um, of, of our way at look of looking at values. Um, we know a lot about scientific revolutions. So I, I just listed here the, the points that I consider important to the development of a, now. Uh, religious wars, conflict between various religions led to the distrust to religion and uh, people like many scientists of that time were trying to escape all these con conflicts by escaping religion. That, that was happening not all at once, not in a short time, but this was the process when science started distancing itself more and more from religion, started carving for itself its own space. And what they did, they did it by emphasizing the power of the human mind and, and seeing the human mind as universal, as this, as this way of communicating between humans on the same level, because the belief was that more or less the human mind operates in the same way, unlike emotions and feelings, which are individual in that sense that they are, they are related to every human being in somewhat different way. That, that what makes us different from one another, whereas our reason makes us similar, makes us able to communicate with one another, to discuss issues, to find an agreement, and so on. And I listed here the names, again, that you all know, but I consider for the scientific revolution and then for, uh, for the development of new types of ethics leading to computer ethics. Uh, first and foremost, these names, Rene Descartes, 
and Blaise Pascal, both scientists, both mathematicians, and Pascal being a physicist as well. Uh, Descartes um, focusing mostly on the individual human mind, the cogito principle, and so on and so on. Pascal being somewhat very uh, famous saying about the reason does not that about the heart that has reason reasons that reason knows nothing about and so on. So um, Pascal seeing the human being as kind of a like split entity, Descartes focusing on reason first and foremost. And then we have in ethics these two names that again I consider very important, namely Immanuel Kant with his with his categorical Im imperative, with his deontological ethics, with his uh, claim that human is human being is a value in itself and has the highest value. It's interesting because. Kant himself was a religious person, uh, but in a scientist, he removed religion from his investigations. So I consider that a very remarkable uh, approach. He was not like Pascal in that in that respect. He 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 drew, drew a very clean line between one and the other. And I added a philosopher who came shortly after Kant, Jeremy Bentham. He was not a mathematician. Kant was a physicist, by the way, too. Uh, Bentham was a philosopher and a an, an ethicist for whom ethics was uh, the priority. We know him as the creator of utilitarian ethics that was later on perfected by John Stuart Mill. And Bentham was also the creator of this utilitarian principle. Both Kant's ethics and especially Bentham's ethics later on proved very, very useful for computer ethics because these two types of ethics actually are the easiest ones compared to all the other ones to, to sort of like, you know, be treated by computers and, and 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 translated into into sort of more like mathematical approach to ethics than the than the earlier types of ethics. I think that also because the earlier types of ethics were more rooted in like real human beings with all their faults and 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 emotions and uh, and uh, yearnings and whatever, but. Um, I think that these are definitely the names we need to remember when we are talking about present day um, technology, ethics, and, and the conflicts between them, or maybe, uh, which is my aim for this presentation, um, a way of, of uh, lessening these conflicts and hopefully in the future eradicating them. So halfway summary would be that uh, when we have ethics within a religious system, it is relational, it is community oriented, it is it is focusing on an on a human being who is acting in the real environment. When we talk about ethics within science, it is reason oriented. It is oriented on a human individual, not really on a community. Community is not the starting point. It's universal, it's abstract, and is applicable globally everywhere in, uh, in like, you know, using different types of tools and stuff and so on. So <clears throat> now this is kind of like a quick, uh, uh, overlook of what we have <clears throat> now as the, what I perceive major problems with the development of uh, science and technology after the scientific revolution. Um, as I said, it started in Europe. We know what happened later on. Europe basically, basically conquest 
the world, right? We have colonization. At that time, already the rational uh, ethics, the Kantian type of ethics, the ethics that is universal, meaning um, assuming that all human beings are basically similar because they are rational human beings. It is spreading uh, around the world, but it is not spreading around the world in cooperation with other societies. It's imposed on other societies around the world with the help of technology, uh, by the use of uh, technology. And scientists, actually, you, we know 19th century was really the century of the of a struggle between science and religion, and there were quite a lot of animosities there. Eventually, science declared itself objective to the point that values do not apply to it, right? Scientific truths are scientific truths. There is no moral judgment involved until we reached the point of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and we had to start thinking about looking at this uh, objectivity and value neutra neutrality of science in a new uh, in a new light. And that was coinciding time-wise with the birth of computers. It's all Second World War, and here we have Wiener about whom Terry was talking. Wiener who first so and clearly talked about the necessity for science and for scientists to think of themselves as moral entities, not just kind of like, you know, um, one other type of a machine. So, <clears throat> but that was, as I said, it was the Second World War that there was the war all over the world, technology was using was being used as weapons, and it was being used as a tool of oppression. Um, technology, especially computer technology, started developing very fast. The Anglo-Saxon world now became the leading um, machine, <laughs> if I may say so, uh, for the whole globe. But it, it's maybe because of the world, Cold War, maybe because of economy, maybe because of the human nature, maybe because of the nature of the technology itself, the technology became the tool of domination now, clearly. That the computer technology was created in the Western world, and then the rest of the world had to accept it and had to learn how to use it. And it basically had no way of saying no. And it happens until today still. Today, we even more than ever have no way of escaping this technology. You either do it, you either use it, or you cannot realize your own goals. You cannot become a fully functional. Yeah, you cannot become a flourishing human individual if you reject uh, the newest technologies. Uh, I, I don't even start talking about artificial intelligence. I see here a very, very big problem of competing values. We have these wonderful ethical systems, but right now we didn't get there yet. We didn't eradicate any of the evils that we were dealing with. However, there is, there is a new movement here, and that is my last slide, so I hope I will, I will be uh, in, in the brackets of my allotted time. Uh, I didn't put uh, over above Dr. Frank Wilczek's name. Uh, three names that I would like to add here. There is, ever since I think more or less 1980s, it started germinating when the artificial intelligence started to be 
perceived seriously as 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 an important technological development this whole concept of uh, moral machines of spiritual machines that was um, Ray, Ray Kurzweil, I don't know whether I pronounce it that way, that you would accept this pronunciation, who wrote about spiritual machines, he's still very, and Wendell um, Wallach, who wrote this book about uh, um, morality of computers. I, right now, I have, I have an empty head. I don't remember the title of that book. But anyway, so there are now uh, among the scholars those who start thinking in terms that reason in, uh, alone is not enough, that there is something more to it. There is, they don't use the word God yet. They don't use the word higher power yet, but they are bringing spiritual aspects to the human being and to the machines because the machines, these machines, when uh, artificial intelligence, they are the extension of a human being. I, I missed, I kind of like, you know, um, neglected talking about this part. And I want to bring this this name of Dr. Frank Wilczek as, as, as the closing of my presentation because I will write a little bit more about this phenomenon uh, when I when I do the, the written part of my presentation. Uh, I don't know whether this name is very well known to everyone here. So just to remind you, he received the Nobel Prize in Physics together with David Gross and David Pulitzer. He was at the time just 51 years old. And <clears throat> Wilczek is one of those who uh, who who worked on the theory of the dark matter. I, I'm not a physicist, and I may say something that is completely wrong in terms of physics, but it is a huge addition to the understanding of the nature of reality. And he was working on it continuously, and continuously he, 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 he kind of developed in himself this dissatisfaction with this purely purely um, rational approach to our vision of reality. He himself was raised as Roman Catholic. Then he became an atheist or agnostic, he calls himself this or that. But when the artificial intelligence emerged, he was one of those, there were these four authors uh, who wrote with Stephen Hawking in 2014, this letter that was the warning about artificial intelligence and what kind of existential danger it can cause to the, uh, to the humankind. And I think ever since he's progressing towards looking at the universe and the human being and artificial intelligence as something more than just a mind. Um, this May in 2022, uh, Wilczek received the Templeton Foundation prize. I was talking to Marv, uh, how well Templeton Foundation is known in Turkey, and I'm not sure whether it is very well known, but it is one very famous and very powerful foundation in the United States. And the, the, the prize that they are giving, uh, giving every year is a prize for progress toward research or discoveries about spiritual realities. And that is what Wilczek received as a prize. So now I'm intending to, to, to do some more research on his views on that matter. But that is, for me, just, just like, you know, the beginning, this is, this is what we need to look at. What the great minds see now in the spiritual aspect of reality and of human beings. Did I exceed my time? No, no? Uh, that is timely question, very timely question, because it is, uh, we have completed time, but uh, we are ready to take your concluding, uh, concluding remarks, uh, if you like, Christina. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for letting me speak and like, you know, to, 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 to kind of make my mind work a little bit more effectively, maybe, hopefully. It's such a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Really, uh, thank you very much for this uh, comprehensive presentation. Um, we have we have uh, maybe from our listeners online listeners. If you have questions, uh, we will raise the questions uh, in the end of this uh, session. Uh, so um, now uh, we are ready to move on to our next uh, speaker, uh, Heba Rauf uh, from Istanbul. Uh, she's uh, She's joining from Istanbul, Mihaldun University. And if you're ready, Heba, we are ready also to hear you, please. Okay, Salaam Alaikum everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity. <laughs> uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Of course, very clearly, please. Okay, so I tried to squeeze my ideas basically in this presentation in a way. Uh, and I come from a different background. Uh, I'm very uh, humbled in the uh, in the presence of uh, philosopher professors. I come from political science, so we make the problems you try to solve it. So <laughs> we are the ones who are all the time messing around. So uh, I also am interested in sociological issues, and I also uh, am interested in the uh, religious uh, dimension of social life. So my choice was to talk uh, basically about the virtual and the virtuous and the ethics of the new places and non-places. Uh, of course, we have um, been witnessing a lot of changes and I wanted to combine actually my uh, interest in three uh, topics, the interest in urban sociology, the interest in new technology. Uh, I also contributed to the establishment of a big uh, website uh, on Islam on the net quite early, 1999, and uh, I had this experience for five years at the beginning, you know, of the of the encroachment of religion on the internet as well. <laughs> so I had some experiences that provided me with some reflections on the theoretical aspect. And uh, I'm also interested in, uh, in how religion can be, uh, the transcendental can be put on this very technological and the implications of that. So I chose to talk about the virtual and the virtuous, the ethics of the new places and non-places. And I wanted to start by uh, stating that, um, uh, I don't know if I can move this, yeah, I could. Uh, the virtual as urban. Uh, I wanted to talk about the virtuous, uh, the virtual space, but also approach it from uh, William Mitchell's uh, uh, side when he uh, described uh, utopia, the urban life as it is urban life, but not as we know it. So quite quite early in the year 2000, he tried to figure out how can we describe this virtual space, the internet. And he said that the global digital network is not just a delivery system for emails, web pages, the digi digital televisions, and later applications, but also he argues that we must extend the definition of architecture and urban design to encompass virtual places as well as physical ones. So he saw actually the internet as urban space, as an extension of the urban space. And this would necessitate that we approach it from the same perspective of the problems that we are facing with modernity that uh, uh, Professor Christina mentioned. There, there, is, there are paradoxes and there are of course revisions as well. I mean, though we started with hoping that technology would liberate the individual, eventually we ended up with uh, technology as ideology. And this was the description of Habermas. So uh, he proposed uh, at that time, to, uh, to 22 years ago, uh, William Mitchell proposed that strategies for the creation of cities that not only will be sustainable, but will make economic, social, and cultural sense uh, in an electronically interconnected and global world. And he actually was very optimistic. He said, we will have rich and social relations, vigorous a vigorous local community life, uh, uh, and he was very optimistic about how this connect connectivity can actually provide us with a lot of uh, social uh, social life uh, and uh, social integration. But actually, this was not the case. I will come to Mitchell later. I just started with him because I wanted to make this relation between the virtual and the urban. And hence, we are talking about the urban. Let's go back a little bit to understand what the urban actually was about. So the history of cities, technology, and virtues, I try to address the issue of the city and virtues as in Greek philosophy. 
there was that sense that we cannot become virtuous unless we are uh, citizens in a city. Then the Hellenistic approach of Stoics when they talked about cosmopolitanism, going beyond the city to become more of a global citizen, and then city and obligation in the Roman uh, Empire, Cicero and others, and then the city of God of St. Augustine, you know, that the city has this metaphysical aspect or it's mirroring another world that is much more transcendental, etc. And then our move to the global city and, and capitalism in our modern times. So in philosophy, we have this wealth of ideas about how the spaces can also contribute to virtues and turn individuals into, uh, into virtuous individuals. If we move to the 20th century, we have the work of Zimmel, who started to become a bit skeptical about that. He was watching the new type of cities emerging and developing, and he said that the metropolis actually uh, puts a lot of stress on our mental life. So this is not the promised heaven that, that modernity promised us, uh, the intensification of nervous stimuli uh, compared to the rural uh, setting, uh, where the rhythm of life and sensory imagery flows more slowly, so speed and time, and more habitually, the development of uh, uh, norms and customs that were basically one of the uh, uh, of the aspects of social life that were attacked by modern thinking, uh, the habits and the traditions, etc., and more evenly. So you you could actually uh, have this life in the rural uh, life. What comes in the city is actually a new type of values: a punctuality, calculability, exactness, subjectivity, and impersonality. We have to take this along with us because these dimensions actually affect very much our understanding of virtues. Okay, so we'll take them uh, on our way and I will come back to, to them later uh, again. If we move to Louis Burke, we talked about urbanism as a way of life. And uh, he also focused on the nervous overstimulation that was mentioned by Zimmel. He was actually drawing on Zimmel a lot. And he defined the city as have defining character characteristics by large population and the size, a heterogeneous nature, and a defined boundary. And he also was very skeptical of uh, urbanism as a way of life because he thought that it is, again, putting a lot of pressure on our understanding of ourselves. Worth uh, thought that urbanization, again, can be defined by anonymity, mobility, and transiency, formality of relations, social distance, regimentation, and segmentation of personality. And the segmentation of personality bit leads us back to the mental health of Zimmel. You know, there is so much pressure uh, on us. And if this is the urban situation described by urbanists at that time, uh, technology was part and parcel of that and communication as well was mentioned in terms of techniques of building the self, whether it is uh, built on its own will or affected by the technology around it. Mumford also tried to introduce uh, somehow a, a more idealistic perspective of the urban, but uh, he was disenchanted. Uh, he started in his uh, work on what is the city by talking about the social drama and uh, that people have their own uh, role in that drama. And he ended up when he wrote about the history of city uh, uh, to be in his uh, prospect and rest retrospect to be much more doubtful about what we did with our cities across history, and that actually he was a bit more uh, pessimistic. So uh, the spectacle took over the essence of uh, the quote-unquote idealistic aspect of the city, and uh, his work later was not very uh, uh, enthusiastic about that. Heidegger, of course, is also someone very important to remember because he talks about building, dwelling, and thinking. And hence, if we consider the virtual to be uh, urban, then what type of dwelling and thinking do we have on the virtual space when we are dealing with technology of the internet with all its different layers and, uh, and different uh, uh, manifestations that started with the internet, but now uh, moved to the uh, um, smart devices that we hold in our hands. And also this will be mentioned uh, after a bit. So we witnessed this shift when we are moving towards the virtual spaces and the internet technology from utopia to heterotopia in urban sociology and from, from utopian, and, uh, utopian and ideological thinking of Karl Mannheim to Michel Foucault when he was talking about other spaces, utopia and heterotopias and changing meaning of many uh, or, or many meanings of space. Uh, None place by Marc Auger also. Uh, so uh, Foucault talked about the spaces 
that actually have different meanings and layers, etc., but that, that are compared to or versus the home somehow, you know, and versus the public sphere of Habermas. But Mark Auger started talking about how technology reshaped our uh, our spaces and the uh, emergence of non-spaces like uh, airports, like uh, um, um, uh, the different uh, stations, metro stations and spaces where the movement is very speedy and we actually don't build a relation with the space. Uh, and, and digitalization is very important here. It's, it's part and parcel of all of that. And this mirroring between the digital management of the spaces uh, that are heterotopian or non-places or the city or whatever, and the communication is actually getting more and more uh, closer. And uh, we don't want to be digifile <laughs> nor digiphob. You know, it's like we're not, we don't go into whether we accept this technology or refuse it because as Professor Christina mentioned, we cannot actually do without it because there are so many technical aspects about governance and, and management and uh, facilitating the life of people, if you go even to the aspects and uh, spheres of health, etc. But there is an issue about how this communication affects and corrodes virtues. Uh, last but not least, Lefebvre, when he was uh, offering his critique of everyday life, and he said that we are heading towards cheer consumption, and cheer consumption also affects our understanding of virtues, not Lefebvre that says, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about that. And he talked about boredom versus uh, societal promises, and of course, criticized capitalism. And Zygmunt Bamond uh, also introduced his own uh, critique. I don't want to go into the details so that I can move to uh, our Islamic religious understanding. So. I don't think that what I'm offering is only, only limited to Islam, but I can say also it's, 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 uh, it can be shared by people of faith in, in this age. Uh, how can the philosophy and religion uh, sort of uh, look at virtues in this uh, age of, um, of very speedy uh, urban way of life and everyday life, coupled by the technology and, uh, and the, uh, the digitalization uh, of our flow of information, but also of securitization and other aspects that are very much interwoven into, into that, which is something that sometimes we ignore, the, the, the sort of securitization aspect. And I chose to focus on a specific notion that I think is very important and reflecting of uh, virtues, because we cannot take all virtues, which is friendship. Because I think that uh, uh, on the virtual space, many of the applications and many of the platforms create relations between people that are described as friendships. We have friends on Facebook, we have followers on Instagram, we have, you know, this notion of friendship has historically been very much linked to citizenship and to a good life. So starting from Aristotle to Abu Hayyan al-Tawhidi in Islamic philosophy and thought and his book on friendship and friends and other aspects that relate the political to the social. Uh, what are the main values compared to what uh, Zimmel and Wirth mentioned of anonymity, impersonalization, speed, you know, and, uh, and uh, 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 the different aspects of social life in our modern time in, in the urban space? Uh, the, the understanding of friendship is based on brotherhood, altruism, honesty, commitment, sacrifice, empathy, and also on some ontological aspects, existential aspects, seeing, listening, touching, smelling, walking, traveling. There is a dimension of mobility, a dimension of interaction and engagement and uh, communalities that developed friendship historically. This is not the case with uh, the online friends. There is a high degree of secularization of the process of building friendships. And there is science as ideology, as I mentioned, that leads to anonymity, digital, uh, the digitalized relation, spatial gap between the individuals, lack of commitment and the corrosion of character, and indifference and potential of cruelty. So if you don't like uh, the, the digital or the uh, uh, sort of virtual friends on the different uh, uh, communication platforms, you simply block, block on or unfriend. You don't negotiate. And the, the images are taking more and more um, a weight instead of words and, and argumentation and communication and, uh, and uh, discussion. So uh, this takes us from the religious, that we, I can uh, state so many religious uh, texts and, and the history of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his relation to his friend Abu Bakr. We didn't have the disciples like Christianity. We had the Sahaba, the companions, and we had this friend who was the first caliph after Muhammad, uh, Abu Bakr, and a lot can be, can be mentioned here of religious texts. 
But going back to uh, the problem that we are facing now when we talk about friendship in a virtual space and in a digital age, we have a problem with language and the word and the self. Jacques Ellul has already been very critical of modern cities from a Christian perspective. And he also wrote about the humiliation of the word. He talked about the image-oriented person. Sherry Turkel, who teaches at MIT, is also uh, 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 realizing that these digital platforms actually corrode our ability to use language. And she wrote about reclaiming the conversation and she uh, had the critical perspective of the second self, computers and human spirit and many other uh, aspects. So we already have a critical uh, uh, body of literature regarding how uh, the urban spaces, but also the virtual spaces affect very much individual and human communication and all the values that I mentioned that are related to a broader sense of friendship that is Aristotelian in its sense, you know, the friendship that leads to uh, an understanding of the common good and an understanding of citizenship and the good life uh, generally. And I think that uh, uh, there, there are dimensions of digitalization and the religion uh, that are challenging us. Uh, two aspects, uh, because uh, I want to conclude here with what uh, Professor Christina mentioned when she said, there is no escape from technology and there is no escape from uh, this digitalized uh, world we are living in. It's part and parcel of our life and we have to somehow accept it. And it's fairly true. We cannot do without it unless you go and live in the mountains. It's very difficult. I mean, it even penetrated the rural areas and, and every place has got its own connectedness to the, to the wider network, etc. But I think that two aspects are very important when it comes to virtues and to uh, realization of the, the, the human self which is the behavior, one aspect is behavioral and the other aspect is spatial. So awareness about what is going on regarding our virtues, uh, what uh, Bauman called uh, morality without ethics. You know, it's like there is a di dilemma in what we are witnessing through the modern world today. So one aspect would be behavioral, how individuals react with that. One of the aspects that uh, Heidegger mentioned is that actually the urban life was about mortals, the divine, uh, nature, uh, and, uh, and other uh, aspects, uh, earth and sky. And our relation to nature has been completely destroyed. And people lock themselves, and the, 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 the time that we had during the COVID resulted in so many very interesting uh, research uh, work that has been done in many uh, parts of the world regarding how locking ourselves from nature actually affected us, us very negatively, but we have been locked in a way in our own non places running around the city or being locked in our uh, uh, rooms uh, at home with our computers or uh, uh, smartphones. So I think the, the awareness is very important. The behavioral aspect should be changed. How much we divide our time and time here also is a very important aspect because uh, virtues cannot flourish without giving people time and giving ourselves time and giving time to the public purposes and public causes. And uh, the, the behavior is very important, how we use technology, but we are not abused by technology. And the second thing that uh, takes us back to the urban dimension of modern technology and how it's part and parcel of our urban life is the spatial dimension. And here, I think that we cannot talk about virtues uh, that are um, uh, completely uh, separate from uh, spaces and uh, our everyday life in the city. And hence, talking about humanizing our urban spaces is very essential because people basically are suffering from uh, uh, colonization, not only of their time from a capitalist perspective, but also uh, of their spaces. And all the work of Saskia Sassen on the global city and flows and, uh, uh, and how the modern city uh, is basically now in a global era, uh, reshaped by global capital, etc. Uh, necessitates that we cannot work only on the side of how to deal individually with technology. I mean, as the individual with his awareness, his or her awareness, and how we can help people understand that they have to have a balanced life between nature and technology, <laughs> the natural and the robot, but also how our spaces needs to be uh, redesigned in order to facilitate uh, a, better, uh, a better communication and a better building of social relations. Otherwise, uh, our problem will not be artificial intelligence. Our problem would be that we would turn ourselves into robots. And this is also what uh, what uh, Sherry Turkel talked about, you know, this uh, sort of uh, mechanization of the of the human mind. 
and uh, and starting from Zimmel when he talked about how we start changing our psychology to cope with all these stimuli to the mechanization and, and computerization of our minds. I think that uh, virtues are in a, uh, in a, in a severe crisis. And uh, I think that uh, this should be a dialogue between all those who are interested from different backgrounds, whether they are secular or religious, who are more interested in the human self uh, as a social self, not as an individual self. And it's never too late to, to reclaim uh, these meanings uh, in a globalized world we, where we can have this uh, conversation. And I think this is why this uh, platform uh, was very important. Yani. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ebaro. Uh, and uh, I am very happy not to warn the speakers for the time out. Uh, I'm really happy for that. This presentation was is inspired by the West and by the East. And actually every figure, every scholar and every term uh, mentioned in the presentation uh, requires a detailed uh, and further uh, work. We, we know that and uh, thank you for bringing uh, to the table all these terms and uh, scholars uh, have uh, and the same uh, thing for other speakers also. Now uh, we are ready to go to uh, Pakistan and listen to Amana Rakib uh, for uh, her presentation. Uh, the title of the presentation is The Ethics of Technology and Islamic Approach. Um, Amana, uh, you have the microphone, please. Thank you very much, and I feel really honored to be invited over for this conversation. And it's uh, it's been a wonderful two hours that I have been listening to all the scholars. Uh, salam and hello, everyone. Salam and rahim in the name of God, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Um, I would have a few comments before officially. Um, going with the slides and uh, discussing uh, my presentation. Uh, one is, of course, you know, because, you know, we've been talking about the hegemony and the oppression of technology and how it creates a certain kind of human beings and societies and they, um, and how our spaces have been sort of taken over by our social spiritual selves, by the more technologized selves. And this very, uh, you know, the way we began with Dr. Taro, you know, figuring out the slides and the PowerPoint and then Christina, you know, so it just showed that. Uh, and then also because I for myself felt very disconnected, you know, not not part of because it's so distant uh, when we when we look at the and, and the, the, the very mode when we have these virtual workshops and conferences, you know, so the content might be there, but you know that that feel that the, the feeling that you have when you when you really when you are uh, in person you know, the presence, the metaphysical presence and all of that, which is lacking. So before this, um, the Zoom meeting started, um, I was in a totally different world and, and sort of transported into this technolo technologized world for two hours. And then once it's finished, I'll be retransported or transported back, uh, which again just shows the very the very superficiality of the experience and even the knowledge sharing, you know, apparently these are important and they they help us learn from each other and work together. But, but the fact is that it sort of also ratifies, you know, when we are having, you know, we are sort of criticizing technology via technology, that's sort of an argument and that people usually, you know, the, the, the ones on the pro-technology camp, uh, they usually say that, you know, you, you, you guys are doing this, but you're using all these platforms. So I, for myself, for instance, I, um, I'm actually nowhere on any of these platforms, uh, and 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 I really know how difficult it is. You know, even uh, sort of collaborating for this for this workshop, and I said, no, I don't have a WhatsApp number. I don't use WhatsApp. It just puts me into so much um, difficulty. You know, just the logistics, the more um, the more material aspect of it. I mean, so I'm discussing all of this because this all has implications on how technology has reshaped us and we never wanted this sort of a world we were never asked if we wanted to live in a world like this but we are sort of doomed to live like this but anyways i'll now begin with the more, uh, with my formal presentation and i'll share my screen
So I um, so I hope this is uh, visible to everyone. Um, All right, so I'm doing this, the Islamic philosophy of techno-social good. Um, and I'll give a, a, a bit of a background. Uh, so I completed my doctorate in 2014 from the University of Queensland um, in religious philosophy and ethics. This is in Brisbane, Australia. And my dissertation is titled Islamic Ethics of Technology and Objectives and the Approach. Um, all right, so before I go on with uh, with these things, one, one more thing that I would like to add is um, that um, I really feel that um, I'm placed at a very rightful position Today, uh, the fourth place, because I, uh, when, you, when you listen to, to, to my presentation, you'll find as if I'm, I, without knowing what, what Dr. Terrell or Christina or, or Dr. Hiba were, um, I, I didn't have a clue uh, what they, they were going to talk about, but my presentation kind of synthesizes. So I have all these elements. So the flourishing bit, of course, I'll have the Slavic coinage for all of this, but then I have that very critical perspective that Christina brought to the table. And then also how Dr. Hiba um, talks about virtues. So all of that you'll find kind of compressed in, um, in my talk today. So um, despite not being there on Facebook ever uh, in 2020, I, along with my co-researcher, received a Facebook Research Ethics Grant. Um, and this was, uh, and we worked on the Islamic ethics of AI because AI has been discussed by um, some of you uh, before me. Um, and then for the first time as part of the grant, we had this international conference on Islamic ethics and AI, which was held in Lahore, Pakistan back in December 20, oh no, this was in 2012, this was 2021, I think I mixed up the, the digits. Uh, so, um, and then there's the website that has all the, uh, so if anyone who's interested to know the Islamic view towards technology in general, or AI in particular can benefit because we have all the the, uh, the talks and the lectures there. So, and these videos deal with various dimensions of the questions that ensue from the AI developments informed by the Islamic metaphysics and ethics. Um, and then a paper based on um, our research during the whole course of this research grant uh, recently got published. It's titled Islamic Virtue-Based Ethics for AI. Um, and then also the, my book that came out of my doctorate dissertation, um, um, I, I really find it was published back in 2015, but now since the last two, three years, I've been like, there's so many people who are approaching me, academics and researchers, uh, you know, uh, and, and I've been a part of a podcast series by University of Notre Dame. They had this uh, tech and ethics series, and I was invited over for that as well. And so there's a great interest, and that just shows the, the amount of apprehension and the amount of fear that people are now having with each passing day, and they are looking at, you know, the available works and resources, and especially the ones that are rooted in something that's pre-modern, that's, um, you know, that brings a, a, a perspective that is not kind of inspired or sort of steered by the very technological logic. Um, and then again, we go back to the, the religion and the religious uh, metaphysics and religious ethics uh, for those things. So, you know, the, the uncertainty that, that surrounds the, the whole technological question. Um, I believe I'm, I'm audible and everyone is hearing me fine because it, again, it's just one way talking. So uh, please let me know if everyone's able to hear me well. Yeah, yeah there is no problem. We can hear all right, you. All right, thank you. I mean, again, this is this is also a one side to technology, right? So I'm actually talking to the walls in front of me, but nevertheless, yeah. So um, again, um, now um, uh, the when I, when I uh, 
bring to this conversation the Islamic normative framework. So um, I just bring the, the key terms. And here I actually, if you can look at, uh, you know, the, the, the fourth point, uh, the second point, it says fitra, which is the Arabic term for human nature, not just the Arabic term, it's the Islamic term because um, uh, it has, uh, it's, uh, it's a valuable term within the Islamic theology and also Islamic ethics. Um, uh, and um, I can refer to Dr. Uh, uh, Terrell's um, uh, uh, idea that, you know, we have this, uh, you know, despite healing from different cultures, we have this human nature or fitra. And, and I find this very visible that because I work in the area of philosophy of technology and I, um, and I, and I read up on, you know, all sorts of works and uh, critical literature. And, uh, and one thing that I'm really inspired by is the fact that no matter from which vantage point these uh, criticisms are, or the questions or the ethical dilemmas that are coming, uh, whether religious, or secular, or even within the secular tradition from whichever perspective, uh, the things that most of the, the scholars, the academics, I would say the, the sensible uh, citizens are worried about, they're pretty much the same. They're, 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 and that actually uh, refers to this idea of having this essential human nature where, which is similar irrespective of you know the, the age or the, the spatial um, area where, or the culture to which we belong. And get, get Gives much hope for for reaching some um, some common denominators uh, where we can actually because again as this has been um, talked about that it's a, it's now this whole digitalization and technologization it's it's global right so no no culture no society is is free from it and therefore we need to just like the the digital digitization is global again the the ethics or or how we want to. Um, to sort of rethink and reframe it, that also has to be global. It cannot be local um, anymore. So it's it's wonderful to to know that there are some very and this notion uh, within the Islamic tradition is actually. Um, the uh, a metaphysical notion, because again, this does not refer to just the, the physical makeup or the physical constitution of human beings, but this more of the spiritual, moral, social dimension that's there in our transcendental divine selves that we have and that distinguishes us from the rest of the creation. So, uh, so again, that and and whatever uh, the the my other esteemed colleagues have talked about regarding um, you know the human need, for instance, of altruism and brotherhood and compassion and community. And and you know, um, Dr. Christina saying that we are not just the rational selves; we are the emotional beings, and so all of that is uh, sort of captured in this one term, Petra, that we 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 have this element of intellect and rationality, but we are uh, we have these emotions, and we need these fellow feelings. We need compassion, no matter how smart we are. If we are sick, we need people. We need kind people who care for us. Uh, no matter what age group we belong, etc. You know those, and and that's like that's our common common experience. Everybody, uh, a lay person as well as a, as a scholar, would would agree to these things. Um, so that's one very basic um, idea that informs the Islamic normative framework uh, when we talk about technology. Then there's this idea of ihsan, uh, which is. Um, uh, which is again very deep and also broad and it has this excellence which is the spiritual moral excellence and this is one of the the key objectives of the, the islamic worldview or islamic uh, religion or faith system as a whole to have not just uh, individuals who have excellent uh, moral character and i really feel happy as these words and these terms resonate with what others have said before me and so i remember someone using uh using the term these terms of character and so also on a, on a community-wide scale, because Islam is a very social community dimension of flavor, so to say. And, and the idea of Ihsan also captures the idea of virtue, right? So it has to be, you know, so our, our um, uh, objective or the final goal in life is to, to really cultivate those virtues in us and try to, to, uh, to reach uh, as high as we could. And, and this could not be done alone. You need to have a community of individuals who help each other in uh, cultivating these virtues. And, um, and that resonates with this idea of techno-moral wisdom. Um, and this is, again, not uh, my um, 
uh, way of putting it is uh, Dr. Shannon Veller, um, who, who works on uh, 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 on the philosophy and ethics of technology, and she used that, and I really found that this this would uh, this could really be put under the canopy of Ihsan, because uh, because uh, Ihsan really means people, uh, individuals, and communities that are uh, moral that are wise and then so so you use technology uh, um under the guidance of that that higher wisdom um uh, of cultivating virtues and whether technology is actually contributing to us that or sort of that's um going against it so again that that also goes in there. Uh, then there's this idea of Nisan or balance and Dr. Hiva, she was talking about, um, uh, you know, the, the problems of our urban life, you know, the, 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 the sheer speed and the superficiality and um, all of that, where we are literally oblivious to our next door neighbors and we are sort of talking to somebody, you know, two continents away. Those sorts of um, ironies that we experience day in and day out that brings to this idea of Misa, that the way our, our fitra has been created, our human nature has been created, it's like, um, uh, it's uh, it's it's meant to have that balance, not just between our rational and emotional faculties, but also so between uh, you know our individual selves and the social selves, and also between nature um, and technology, and and there has to be a hierarchy, right? And 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 when we are talking about technology, we need to to really figure out as to where we should place technology in that hierarchy, because if that's wrongfully placed, then it just really harms the whole balance and or mizan and the individual level where people are, would suffer a lot from those narcissistic behaviors mental disorders, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of research is on that, the environmental degradation, that this whole system that's, you know, very energy intensive um, is, is using so that the environmental balance gets disturbed, the societal balance gets disturbed where, where we, we become so connected to our gadgets that we are not really, um, uh, all those attributes that Dr. Dr. Hibbard is talking about regarding the Islamic idea of friendship. And, and we, we see how they are deteriorating day by day within the, the societies. Uh, so, so that's another idea when we are talking about technology that needs to be um, sort of applied. Um, now, um, and uh, this, this last bit would actually resonate with, uh, with, with, with uh, Dr. Terrell and because he was talking about a flourishing, human flourishing. And um, in the Islam, uh, Islamic uh, uh, system, uh, the, the very idea is that the Islamic Sharia, the Islamic system of ethics, uh, that the highest objective of that is to have the collective good and welfare of humankind in accordance to the divine code, and at the same time, in accordance to their essential nature. So um, one thing that I found out, uh, 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 you know, again, sort of a um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, not comprehensible is that, uh, so for instance, when Dr. Terrell was talking about the fact that, you know, back in the 60s when Dr. Wiener uh, uh, was talking about, uh, you know, developing the, the information ethics, um, he would say that now we have AI and now how can we have those moral machines? Um, but when we are looking at collective human good and welfare, uh, even the more fundamental question that he should have asked at that time was, why do we need AI? What, what it would do to human beings uh, that's not that cannot be done or that should not be done by human beings. So those going back to the basics of uh, and and these questions we cannot answer if we don't have a very uh, robust and very clear idea of what our human nature is, what we are meant to do, what would eventually really make us happy, um, so on and so forth, right? So, and, and this has been attested to in the previous two COVID years, right? Where people, uh, they were attending everything online from funerals to marriages to everything. And, and that, that didn't make them happy. Which, why was that, you know, apparently? Um, and this has implications for things like the metaverse and so on and so forth, but yeah. So, so again, these are some key ideas. Uh, then uh, in my work, in my in my book, and then I try to apply those ideas to more concrete forms of technology like, like AI, artificial intelligence, what I problematize is whether we are looking at technology as means or end. So it is important to be clear on this sense if technology is a means to reach a certain conception of good life, then the standard of the good life should be meta-technological. I mean, what I mean when I say meta-technological is that 
good life shouldn't be defined by technology. So again, uh, you uh, if, if you say, look, look, technology has made things so easy. Uh, it's so convenient. I didn't have to travel all the way to Istanbul. I didn't have to do this, get the visa stamp, all the hassle. And it's so easy just, you know, talking from the comfort of my home. Um, but um, I would say that now no, we are it's circular because uh, who said that convenience is the highest thing that we should aim for? Um, again, and but then what is convenience and efficiency? That is part of the technological logic because uh, convenience and efficiency is what uh, technology makes possible. So now we are kind of uh, gauging or evaluating technology through those very technological values. And I'm I'm proposing that we should have that standard should be meta-technological, should be above and beyond technological or trans-technological. And then we'll be looking at the design and development uh, according to that prescription or that standard that is provided. Uh, because uh, otherwise technology becomes the, the, the most prized end. And what happens is that instead of technology being um, evaluated in accordance with um, some higher standard of good life, uh, the good life is uh, becomes defined in terms of technological efficiency. Um, then uh, please let me know uh, five minutes prior to when I have to stop because I don't think I'll be able to cover all the slides. So I'll stop whenever you ask me to stop. <laughs> so um, uh, then, then the question is take me the telos, the purpose. So this, this is again a metaphysical question regarding what is good life for human beings. I say that this is not merely ethical question because it goes back to the nature and purpose of human beings, which is a metaphysical question. And um, and, and and that's one way of looking at it. And the other thing is that, uh, again, referring to Heidegger and others who say that the technological practices of a given culture actually exhibit the way world is meaningfully or meaninglessly created and shaped. Um, and then again, this this amount of existential chaos and meaninglessness at so many levels that we that we um, and uh, see in so many ways uh, uh, actually tells us uh, of you know the kind of reality that's created. Uh, even if the line between real and virtual is blurred, then that has metaphysical um, not just metaphysical repercussions, but that's uh, that again goes back to some some very uh, questionable metaphysics of. Uh, who we are as humans. Uh, then this idea of technical quarter script. So um, the, the, the idea is that uh, because it, especially in the Muslim world, uh, this is uh, the most popular idea is that technological artifacts, they are value neutral. Um, and um, I, uh, because I try to have a dialogue with my Muslim uh, uh, fellows but, uh, and at the same time to global scholars and people working on te technological ethics. And I find that uh, Muslims are pretty much uh, uh, under the um, uh, impression that it's value neutral, whereas uh, the technological artifacts are actually inscribed with meaning and value, which are the results of the negotiation process that occur in the design process and at the stage of the of implementation by users. So technologies are seen as containing a script that delegates specific responsibilities and actions to the users, right? So when this technology that we are using now, um, this had this uh, idea of how people should behave, you know? So even so 10 years ago or perhaps 20 years ago, uh, nobody would consider a Zoom meeting to be a meeting at all. Now we are we all are considering so so the kind of responsibility and actions that we are now uh, that's delegated to us is and it's not purely coincidental uh, because um, again those who are um, some of the consequences definitely are intended and designers sometimes could not foresee. But uh, there's something, some kind of life, some kind of a society that you, you want to build. Why, why would you want everyone to carry a smartphone all the time? Why would you want everyone to have a personal laptop? This means that, again, certain responsibilities and tasks would be assigned to everyone to do things, to do certain things that they would otherwise not do, and then also do those things in a certain way. So all of that. Um, so for, I have given another example that the possibility of checking our various digital networking platforms for news updates or social messages encumbers both the sender and receiver of the messages to consider themselves responsible for checking and updating their messages every now and then. So, so that's what you, you become, um, you know, there, there are certain actions that are expected of you. And if you don't do, uh, I'm, I'm not on any of those uh, platforms, but my friends and family, they, they keep telling me that their people, their, their relationships get uh, so 
also uh, uh, affected because you know you you haven't replied you know as you know soon as other person expected you to and lots of you know uh, uh, things happening because of that so yeah uh, so there are this this goes back to what I was saying that there are normative biases in technology so each technology has an agenda of its own this is Postman's quote um, and then another quote that technologies do not exist in a presuppositionless vacuum instead technology proceeds out of our whole human experience and is directed by our ultimate commitments so if we um, again, so so what what is really important for us, um, and uh, that that is actually uh, where technologies come from. You know, the uh, eventual eventually what kind of individuals we want, and what kind of societies and communities we want to build, what kind of relationship we want to have with the nature and the natural environment. All of that is um, a kind of. Um, uh, exhibited in technology, uh, the kinds of technologies that we design and use. Uh, again, uh, one thing uh, uh, that adds to the complexity of the problem is that the idea of progress. <laughs> now, it, 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 even uh, um, uh, the even if the humanist ideas of pro modern progress, they were uh, because they had lots of points of uh, collision with the religious or the Islamic idea of progress. But uh, but still, uh, the, uh, the, the, there was some some solid. They, they were foundational. They believed that you know we could have a betterment of human condition through technology. Now that they have been proven wrong, now that the whole century has shown people to have um, suffered on all accounts because of technology, uh, it's harder to defend this progressivist idea of technology. And then this leads to an even uh, 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 severe formula, which I have uh, labeled as a postmodern formula, which is that the only constant is change. You just value change for the sake of change. It, within humanism, at least, it was change for some utopian future that they thought could be brought about by technology. But now that they, the, the technology does not have that justification anymore, it's just, you know, you are chasing, it starts shaping our ethics as well, because ethics um, has to have that permanence. And then uh, but then it also have to keep, has to keep shifting with the shifting technological realities of the world, which is very actually problematic. Um, so the postmodern orientation is basically a telos of no telos. So this radical plasticity, and that plasticity is um, shown you know, where people have these, you know, they can have the profile of their own choices. So they're actually making and remaking them every day on their um, um, uh, Instagrams and, and other platforms. Uh, the relationships, they, they have become plastic, all of that. And this is not just coincidental. It's because the, the pervasive materialism and violence of late modernity stems from its inability to embrace fully a world purged of any purpose and permanence. And therefore any resulting providential and pro or progressive trajectories the rapid development of various technologies merely amplifies the predicament. A postmodern telos of no telos offers modernity a way out of its dilemma. The radical plasticity of the postmodern orientation is attained because its telos is also its technique, which is dangerous because now technique becomes the telos. So the postmodern telos of no telos is in fact the telos of technique. Um, and this is again uh, the, the very idea that we are actually claiming that now we have no higher uh, principles that can direct or that can guide where we want technology to lead us and then design them accordingly, uh, then technology becomes our master. Um, and then there's also an indifference to ends because again, how could you have an, um, an end? Uh, some some broader ends where everybody could agree on. So you could have workable workability, but no defined end. So you have this account, you can use it for any any thing that you want. Or so we have all of those cyber crimes because again, that's it has to be efficient no matter what. So that's one of the thing that logic is kind of um, informing the whole uh, design process and the development process, uh, which is again technology for the sake of technology or. We should have indefinite technological means. And if we ask, why should we have that? Then that question appears foolish or silly because this question is actually questioning the whole logic uh, underneath. Uh, and, that, and, and this act automatically leads to the morality of means rather than ends. And this is this conflicts utterly with religious ethics in general, Islamic ethics in particular. 
So we are celebrating creativity and innovation without purpose. And this is a symptom of nihilistic thinking. Um, now, we need to redefine uh, human beings ontologically as well, you know, because in order to live uh, and survive in a technological world, uh, it's not just that technology is creating the new needs uh, for human beings, but it's creating actually new human subjects as well, because now we are defined as homo papers, right? We are uh, our most, uh, um, you know, prized or valuable trait is that uh, we fabricate. We are fabricators, and we create new things. Uh, and this is uh, this. this uh, and and I can really uh, 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 see its connection to what Dr. Hiba said regarding. No, it's not Dr. Hiba, but rather Dr. Christina uh, regarding you know those competing moralities that you know whether we are fabricating self, whether we are homo fabers, or we are spiritual, moral, social yourselves. Um, and then there's this axiological or the value side of technologies, which is that the technologies, uh, no matter, you know, so the, the, the designers or, or the developers, they might say that, look, we are, we don't have a moral agenda. Uh, but let, I mean, if somebody doesn't have a moral agenda, that itself is a moral agenda, that you don't think morality to be at all important, so you are developing technology that is dictating each and everything that we are doing these days, and and you you don't have a moral vision for that, or if you have a moral vision, then whose vision is that, right? If your moral vision is that we should abandon Earth and move to Mars, I mean. Should that be the moral vision of everyone else? Uh, so, what is the the, the the vision that you know the majority of sensible people can agree upon, and which was there all along before the uh, the technology started colonizing us? Um, so, so, the, so yeah. So, this specific set of meanings, functions, value, and vision for the society, um, and and what happens is that the technology, with its own values of efficiency and convenience and speed, it prevents other values from being becoming functional or operational and that creates that sort of polarity that's what, and a lot of emotional and mental and spiritual stress where you know you don't want to live with life like this the, the demands that technology puts upon us makes us do that and then also things like people people who are who are living far far away they wouldn't visit their family their parents their relatives and say so, hey, we're we're having these um, you know these Skype uh, sessions or we are having these video chats and that's a replacement because that also pertains to both the ontology ontology and the axiology of technology because uh, you know the, the islamic idea of a person having a spirit a divine rule uh, it uh, it makes altogether different when you are yeah, when you're um, visiting someone in person and so on and so forth. So uh, so the, the questions that we need to ask is, does good life really need to be technological, overly technological? Uh, is self-realization really equal to technological consumption? Is collectivity and prosperity and well-being really equal to technological consumption? So um, in, uh, and here I'm asking the fundamental question because usually people don't make these uh, ask these fundamental questions. They just see that you know AI it's a given, and now you have to see how to make it ethical. But why should we have AI? That because the idea of good life should should be able to help us here. You know why do, are we developing it just because we could develop it? Just every every anything and everything that could be developed should be developed. That sort of logic. Um, so and then also the problems they become redefined because now what is considered a problem is something that can fall under in the domain of technology. So a problem would only be a problem if it can be solved via technology. And I'll talk about if I really get the time to about driverless cars in this respect. So, um, and then um, how these, uh, they are changing the social understanding and practices. So I have got a few examples here of sonography and IVF, right? I mean, it changes people's, uh, uh, you know, views uh, uh, about having children and uh, and about being contented with their lot, with, with the divine decree and all of that. So it, it, it changes people's understanding, social practices, expectations, and, um, and the instrumentalist view, and 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 this also, um, uh, I, I I don't remember. I think it was Dr. Hibba was talking about calculability. So here again, a calculus of averages and probabilities is replacing ends and the common good. So the technological order is reconstituting the moral order in terms of technique. Um, now contrasting. Uh, 
the the postmodern um, uh, uh, technology from how Islam uh, uh, envisions the reality. So Islamic reality, the human self and values both have absolute dimensions. Self and meaning cannot be indefinitely constructed and reconstructed. The idea of human nature fitra is very central. Social ethical values are inferred from the scriptures, which is the Quran and the prophetic hadith. Of, and then there, there's a there's a very uh, um, uh, uh, clear cut distinction between substantive and instrumental God. So there, there are certain things that are instrumental, but they they are only good if they really lead to the substantive good. And if they don't, then uh, they cannot be considered even instrumental goods. And, and that's how we should be looking at technology. So the purpose or objective of the Islamic religion um, is to perfect the human character in accordance with the God-given nature called Tazkiyah, which is the highest goal and highest achievement for a human being. This is the unwavering standard against which all techno-social development is to be judged or measured. Rationale of material and technological development is the uplifting of human soul or moral progress. So they can actualize their humanness in terms of reaching the heights of moral, spiritual excellence or ihsan. In this context, the greatest misery, according to the Quran, is not knowing the true nature and reality of the soul. The great transgression or zulm in Islamic cosmology is the oppression directed to one's own self. Keeping in mind the above cosmology, there are complete sets of responsibilities that allow Muslims their character making by the cultivation of virtues, thereby fulfilling their responsibilities toward other human beings, such as family, like parents, spouse, children, grandchildren, siblings, uncles, aunts, neighbors, community members, oppressed individuals, weak and needy individuals, and so on, and the natural environment like air, water, soil, plants, and animals. So there's again a contrast between efficiency versus virtuosity. So here, efficiency within Islam is not the final value or arbiter. There could be less efficiency if it results in more piety and virtue. Unlike the technologic where the content of the choices made under the rule of efficiency is less important than the rule of efficiency itself. So no matter what choices you make, uh, it's just that they have to be more efficient. Uh, so Islamic techno ethics would be like spiritual moral contemplation that is called the fakr in Arabic and teleological thinking that they will lead to self-awareness and God consciousness, both of which are related. In the Islamic social universe, any technology requires a meta-technological principle for its purpose and validation. No technology is self-justificatory. Practical moral reasoning in the light of objectives of Sharia overrides the technological rationale. Each human activity, technological and non-technological, should contribute to this directly or indirectly. And then the four C's are compassion, community building, uh, care and cooperation that should look at technology from that angle. Now, this is from my book. And uh, it, because these are the five classical objectives uh, within the uh, Islamic Sharia and uh, which contribute to the highest good, which is uh, uh, the, the self-purification and God consciousness. Um, and as you can see that, again, there's, uh, uh, they all go back to the, the highest purpose. So the, these five objectives of religion, life, intellect, property, and lineage. But then uh, we are, if, you, if you look down, you'll see things like human dignity, environment, sustainability, um, and under intellect, thoughtful consumption. So again, we are seeing all these mindless uh, development and mindless consumption of technologies uh, that's very profit oriented as well. So, so again, somebody might say that they're bringing lots of economic benefits, but then they're, they're damaging the human soul, which is the highest, um, you know, uh, objective. So, so we'll have to work out some sort of a, uh, you know, um, um, a consistency. Now, AI through the lens of Islamic techno-social good, it is human beings who need to strive to rise above their biases in the quest for living by truth and justice. So again, when we try to make the machines moral, we are forgetting that, uh, I mean, let's say there, there are some judges or jury that are very biased and that will sentence somebody, a person of color, let's say. And we say that we're replacing them with an AI system that will be more fair. Now, I'm not arguing because there are lots of components that make it unfair, even unfairer than human beings. And there are lots of critical research on that, on how those uh, algorithms are actually biased towards, you know, certain uh, sectors of society. But I'm not saying that. I'm saying that, uh, I mean, should we make machines morals? Should that be the, our goal as human beings? Or should our goal be that 
that people who are appointed as judges or jury, uh, we train such individuals, we have that character in, uh, 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 developed in individuals, so then they become no matter a judge, part of a jury or a doctor or whatever, uh, they, or a bus driver or a, or a car driver, uh, they, uh, they are responsible, they are compassionate, and, and they are, um, um, they are just. So, uh, I mean, that's how, that's how the Islamic tradition looks at it. So virtuous human society do not just need efficient, unbiased court trials. Virtuous human societies, more than anything else, need better human beings in pursuit of exhibiting higher moral ideals. Having a community of virtuous individuals would make the need for many AI applications redundant. Uh, especially the ones that are aimed to substitute human services. In order to improve morally, there will be strong social bond, mutual cooperation, and compassion within the communities. Um, so I'm, 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 I don't have the time, but of course, people who, who are abreast with the uh, work in, uh, in environmental conservation, they know that, uh, you know, those environmentalists, they also say uh, that a lot of human consumption takes place that is damaging to the environment is because people are so alone. Um, Sherry Turku also talks about that, that loneliness, and then they try to consume more and more to, to kind of fight that loneliness and emptiness. And, and if you have gender when meaningful relationships and communities, strong communities and social bonds, um, you won't have the need for a lot of these uh, consumer goods, including technology. So uh, the Islamic normative framework allows an evaluation, arbitration, and determination of a set of collective values that are objective. The individual virtues grow in directions that foster those values. The virtues once firmly instilled allow technical moral choices to be made as individuals, users, and collective units of designers, developers, academics, and policymakers. Without the normative framework of values that act as a regulatory framework, the virtues remain too individual to be able to consciously contribute toward the creation of right AI policies for creating harmonious societies globally. We are in dire need of intra interharmonious communities globally working toward common good and well-being while benefiting from their cultural particularities. And somebody else was talking about that as well. Um, I think I should stop here because I think I've already taken time, more time than what was allotted to me initially. Um, and thank you very much for listening to me. And if there are further questions, concerns, uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm um, available and we can uh, discuss that, I hope, later. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it does not seem to be fair to say you are out of time with all the rich slides. So uh, uh, I didn't interrupt. Uh, so we waited uh, until the end of this presentation because uh, I wanted to see all the uh, slides. Uh, and thank you for the, for the presentation. And we have, uh, we have come to the end of this uh, session. I checked uh, through YouTube and we don't have any question to uh, raise. So um, uh, luckily we registered all these uh, presentations. So uh, uh, later on, uh, the people on YouTube, they will have the chance of uh, referring to these presentations, uh, seeing the slides and reading further uh, work. So uh, I'm really happy to, to be the chair of this uh, rich and this pregnant uh, session. Thank you for um, the, uh, also for uh, technically uh, at us, Merve, for not just technically, for all uh, kinds. Uh, thank you very much, Merve. Uh, Terrell, uh, Dr. Terrell uh, from the States, thank you very much. Uh, Christina, thank you very much. Uh, Hiba from Istanbul, thank you very much. I'm from Pakistan. Emane, thank you for, uh, very much for your contributions uh, in this session. I wish you all the best, and I hope uh, in the forthcoming days, months, years, we will uh, healthily see each other. Uh, have a good Thanks day a and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you much. very much. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.